All right, good morning, church. Happy St. Patrick's Day, you guys. Let's go to our Lord God with a word of prayer to start off. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, uh, the moon and the stars that you've set in place, who are we in this room and all throughout this planet that you are mindful of us, that you're thinking of us, God? On this little blue dot in a solar system that is just so amazing, up until the farthest away galaxies in the universe, God, into black holes and even maybe even parallel universes. You've created all. You've set it all in place. God, we are so in awe of you. And I pray that this time today we can be reminded of who you are, who you were in the flesh, who you are now, and the spirit of you living inside of us. In Christ I pray. Amen. All right, guys. I'm so grateful to be here before you today. Um, it has been an amazing time exploring East Tennessee, and I gotta say, uh, driving through Nashville, driving through from Knoxville to Nashville, I was just seeing the amazing beauty of nature here in East Tennessee, up into Middle Tennessee, and it's a special time, a special time. After uh, this sermon, I highly encourage you guys to go outside and just <laughs> smell the flowers. You know, the PGA is on today, uh, PGA Championship, but don't spend all day inside. Um, I want to focus today on the gospel according to Mark, and we're going to spend a lot of time in a particular chapter, uh, chapter 4, so you can kind of just camp out and turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to look at Jesus calming the storm. Uh, I titled this sermon equanimity through Christ, or equanimity through Christ. Forgive my pronunciation. <laughs> but um, the thing about this is that today we live in a society where we can focus a lot on really good things that are healthy for us, but sometimes these things that are healthy for us, we don't give Christ the credit for them. So, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy in the mental health realm, uh, all these techniques for breathing, uh, meditation, taking walks. Some of these things are spiritual disciplines, but we can forget who taught us them, that Christ walked us through these things in the Bible, that the Father in heaven told us to do these things in the Old Testament. Um, and this is something that I really want to focus on today. But just being that it's so beautiful outside, I wanted to start with a quote from one of the early church fathers, uh, a, a fellow named Origen of Alexandria. And it just keeps with the theme of spring. I don't know if it's spring yet. <laughs> I haven't been in, a, in East Tennessee long enough to experience any of the seasons. And coming from South Florida and the Caribbean, there's really no seasons like that. It's just either hot or less hot. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what Origin of Alexandria said. Those who believe the author of nature to be also the author of scripture, must expect to find in scripture the same sorts of difficulties that they find in nature. So hold that in mind as we turn to Jesus calming the storm, Jesus conquering nature. So we're going to go to chapter 4, verse 35. That day... All right, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> that day, right? So whenever we're reading scripture together, it doesn't matter how long we've been a disciple, if we're just, uh, or even if we're just like exploring the scriptures uh, recently in, in our walk with Christ. When we see something like that day, we can look and say, I wonder what happened that day. So if we go back to the beginning of Mark chapter 4, we see a little bit in verse 1 and 2 what that day looked like, right? In verse 1, it says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into the boat and sat in it, or sat in it out on the lake, while the people were along the shores at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. Okay, so on that day... <laughs> 
Jesus was teaching all day on a boat. Why was he on a boat? Well, okay, if we look even further back into uh, Mark chapters 1, 2, 3, we see that he was on the boat because he had started to gain so much popularity. He had started to gain a following. Uh, as you see, there was a crowd amassed before him. And he had to be on the boat to get some separation from them. So this gives us some context into what we're going to be looking at today. Now, that day in verse 35, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, that's the back of the boat for you guys who aren't on nautical, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. All right, guys, so I think it's really important for us to take note of the fact that as Christians, as believers, as people who not just follow Christ, but carry Christ within us, in our hearts, carry the Spirit within us, we have to believe that miracles exist, that things happened in the Bible in actuality, that this is not just a story, that this is something that f literally happened, and this is our account of what happened according to Mark, right? So in order to help us do that, since we're so far away, so far removed from the story, I want us to uh, have some visual cues of what the Sea of Galilee looked like where this took place. So our awesome tech team in the back, if you could cue up the movie of the Sea of Galilee. There we go. So the uh, sound doesn't matter. I'll walk us through this. Um, here we see in Israel or Palestine, uh, the Jordan River here leading into the Sea of Galilee. And just try and put yourselves into this picture here. You're sitting on the bank, or if you're a disciple like most of us are, you're in the boat with Jesus in this beautiful place, and you're fired up. You're listening to him preach all day long. <laughs> like, what a momentous occasion to be able to listen to Jesus preach all day long. And then, all of a sudden, he says, let's go to the other side once it starts getting dark. It's like, all right, Jesus, it's getting dark, <laughs> but we're going to go. And uh, man, this is a big body of water. It's technically a lake, but I think it's about uh, 13 miles long by seven miles wide. It's about 150 feet deep. And I don't know, I haven't been in Tennessee long enough, but... I don't know how it is here in terms of storms, but it's very common for storms to pop up uh, quite frequently on the Sea of Galilee. And so this is a normal thing that would happen there. And many of the disciples uh, think about it. Peter, uh, Andrew, James, John, they were fishermen by trade. So they would have been used to these storms popping up. And yet they were still terrified, as the scripture says. But we'll get back to that. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. Whose idea was it to go to the other side of Galilee? It was Jesus's, right? So isn't it funny that God has a plan and a purpose for us, but he doesn't always give us the details? How could Jesus be the one who's taking me into this storm? Why, why would that happen? 
sometimes in our lives, we are going to go through storms. Just like the Sea of Galilee has storms all the time, very common. Unfortunately for us, sometimes we bring these storms upon ourselves. But in this case, the storm had nothing to do with how good or bad the disciples were. It's just a fact of life. It's just nature. Here's the thing, though, is that Jesus said, let us go over to the other side in verse 35. And that's as good as a promise as, as you get from God. He didn't say, I think we're going to try and go to the other side. He didn't say, well, maybe we should go to the other side. He said, let us go over there. We're going to the other side. And later when he teaches us how to pray in the gospel according to Matthew, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. And even still the disciples who were with him experienced essentially what is a mental breakdown (laughs) when they tried to deal with the storm under their own means, under their own strength. And I try to put myself in the shoes of the disciples here. Whenever we're reading the Bible, uh, it's important to remember that we are not Jesus in the story. <laughs> we're, you're, you are never Jesus in the story. I am never Jesus in the story. If you want someone to compare yourself to, that's, a, that's another story, but if you want someone to compare yourself to, the closest thing you can compare yourself to is the disciples, right? We're going to be the disciples in the story. And If I think of myself and put myself on that beautiful bank of the Sea of Galilee and I'm fired up listening to Jesus preach and he says, we're going over to the other side and I'm like, all right, let's go. And then I say, oh, wait, Jesus, I'm a fisherman and it's getting dark. You know, think about this. We don't have any floodlights. We don't have any GPS, no Garmin, right, right, Steve? (laughs) No fancy navigational system on, our, on these sailboats. I mean, there's no Coast Guard, to the best of my knowledge. You're just kind of winging it out there. And uh, these guys who are fishermen, they would have known, based off of uh, experience, what the weather conditions would have been like. Even though abrupt storms could happen, they might have been saying, hey, Jesus, I don't know about <laughs> I don't know if we should go in the dark. It seems like a storm might be coming. So when I think of this myself, mounting up to go across the galley in the pitch black of night, I'm like, man, would I be immortalized as Ty, the disciple who decided to stay on the banks of the galley? (laughs) And would I have been a cautionary tale of what not to do in the Bible for the rest of days? But here's, here's where those honest conversations come in handy because it takes that level of humility and honesty in order to fully put yourself before God. Humble yourself before the Lord our God was one of the songs that we sang this morning. And these songs are meant to get us into a mental state where we can truly worship God. Let's look at an example of this level of faith that we should have and that the disciples had just by going into the darkness of night in the face of this oncoming storm. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now the physical evidence before the disciples in the face of the situation of the storm was enough for them to say, You know what, Jesus? I think I might stay on the banks. <laughs> or the, what, the ones who got on the boat, the people who followed them in the boats nearby, they could have said, you know what? It doesn't look like a good situation. Maybe I won't follow you. But when we do have this level of faith that's talked about in Hebrews 11, verse 1, that we just read, this is something that allows us to transcend fear. Fear is something that keeps us on the bank, but that faith brings us into the boat and allows us to at least have the opportunity to know that Jesus is with us going through that storm, even if he's asleep like it is in the story here. 
So now that brings up a next point. When we look back at the body of text in Mark chapter 4, verse 36, they left the crowds behind, but there were also other boats with him. And so the people in these other boats, they weren't, it doesn't say that they were disciples. And when we take this step of faith, when we share that our lives are different because of Jesus, because of what we believe, because of the convictions that we have, because of the spirit that lives within us today, sometimes there will be people who follow. These other boats, they were following Jesus, trying to get as close to him as possible. And, you know, we read the story together. Jesus rebukes the waves and... The storm's calmed and everything's okay, even though things got really hairy for a minute. (laughs) But these people in the other boats, they don't know that it was Jesus that did that. It's only the disciples that knew. Now, again, let's play that game where we imagine that we are the disciples and we put ourselves in their shoes. Eventually, we get to the other side, right? And we're all people. We're going to have organic conversations. We're going to talk and chat once the boats are, are uh, safely on the shore. <laughs> and uh, imagine the, the people in the other boats come up to us and they say, man, oh, man, that was some storm, huh? Can't believe we got away with that one. And we as disciples are just like, oh, yeah, you know, I was so chill. I meditated through it, you know. I was breathing, doing my breathing exercise. I'm, just a, I'm a chilled out guy or I'm a chilled out girl, you know. There's no problem. No, no. As disciples, it's our job to say, man, that guy, Jesus, he, <laughs> he got up and he calmed the storm. You should have seen it. It was incredible. We were trying to bail the water out. I was telling Peter to wake up Jesus, but he was, you know, he was trying to do his own will. <laughs> but man, oh man, Jesus, he just, it was otherworldly. It was God in the flesh. That's the only way we survived. If not for that, we would have been done for. That's, that's how we should be when we go through storms in our life. It's so tempting. It's so tempting to act like we have it all figured out. But nobody does. I don't. <laughs> I've been on this world for 28 years. And I, don't, I probably have less figured out than any of you would want to believe <laughs> or feel comfortable hearing. But it can be so tempting when we come out on the other side of these storms that God brings us through when we decide to wake him up (laughs) within us to say, yeah, yeah, you know, no big deal. I'm okay. I, I, I figured it out. But that's not the truth. The truth is, is that we have to get vulnerable with God just like the disciples did. In verse 38, again, I'll look back at it and say, Jesus was in the stern, the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? I can't be the only one in this room who feels like that sometimes when I'm going through things, when I'm going through a storm. I've had some health issues in the past. And I'll go before God and say, God, don't you care about me? (laughs) Don't you care about me? When we're having difficulties in our romantic relationships, whether they be dating breakups or marital problems, God, don't you care about my marriage? Don't you care about my well-being? Don't you care about my, my dating relationships? Don't you want me to be happy? For those of us that have kids, when they're going through a hard season in life, whether it be with their health or disciplinary issues. God, don't you care about my kids? I've been faithful. I've been following you. I brought them to church every Sunday until they had they could do whatever they wanted. <laughs> and they didn't have to come anymore. God, don't you care about them? In our one another relationships, sometimes, you know, we're all just people. None of us are perfect. Brothers and sisters at times fight even in the church, and it's hard. God, don't you care about 
my relationship with my brother? Don't you care about my relationship with my sister? And this is how the disciples' posture was towards God. And this is how our posture needs to be in vulnerability. Because we have to be broken at times. We have to try everything that we can on our own at times in order to be broken to come before God and say, God, man, I'm wore out. I have no more strength left in me. I have no more breath left in me. I was practicing all the equanimity, all the calmness in the state of a difficult situation. I tried cognitive behavioral therapy, breathing, exercises, qigong meditation, yoga, tai chi. (laughs) I've done it all, but I need you. Could you wake up, please? (laughs) Wake up. And that's what the disciples did, right? You can imagine they tried everything, and then all of a sudden they're like, you know what? We got, we got Jesus. Why don't we wake him up? So let's look, at, let's look at how this posture before God of honesty is actually something that even Jesus practiced while he was on the cross. In Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, we see just the anguish of this psalmist. And this is something that Isaiah, uh, that, that Isaiah spoke of in the book of Isaiah and that Jesus spoke of while he was on the cross. Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day. But you do not answer by night. I find no rest. And here's the thing, right? Yes, Jesus did say this. And yes, the prophet Isaiah did bring this up. But we're looking at this from a 21st century mindset. We're looking at this from a place so far removed in time from how the people who wrote it and who lived this would have interpreted it. When a prophet in the Bible quotes scripture like this, it's meant to be read in totality. When Jesus said this on the cross, it's meant to be read fully. It's meant to be looked at in the whole context of the entire story. So let's look further into the psalm of Psalm 22 and see that what Jesus was trying to get us to go towards. In verse 3 it says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. This is the salvation that Jesus was talking about on the cross when he quotes that scripture in the beginning of Psalm 22, when he quotes the prophet Isaiah. And we should not forget that, that our anguish is a mechanism, a tool to bring us towards Christ, to bring us closer to God through these storms in our lives. It's not meant to break us and leave us shattered. It's meant to call us closer to God. Let's look at the victory and remembrance of this psalm. Because it doesn't just end in salvation. It ends in a reminder of who God is and who we are because of him. In verse 27, I'll read 27 and 31. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Guys, he has done it. And we see that when we make it to the other side. When we're crossing our own seas of Galilee in our lives, when we're going through these issues, relational health, whatever it is for you, 
we have to remember that he has done it already. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to wake him up. And I would argue that we're even more highly favored than the 12 in the story, than the disciples who were with Jesus. Because they had to wake up a physical person. But we carry him within us. Those of us who are baptized into Christ carry him within us all the time. We have constant contact with the creator of all that is, was, and has ever been. Think about that for a second. I was waxing lyrical about how beautiful East Tennessee is, and it is. <laughs> this time of year, it's incredible. I feel so blessed to be here. But at the same time, the same intelligence that allows the grass to be so green this time of year here, that allows all the beautiful flowers to be in bloom, is the same intelligence that lives within us that created all that we can conceive, and even that that we can't. I know for myself that I've spent m way too many storms in life attempting to bail the water out of the boat as the waves crash over. I've spent way too many seasons going through way too many storms trying to man the sails when the winds get strong when I should have and could have just woken up Jesus within me. Now, let's look towards the end of the story here in Mark 4 again and just to remind ourselves. In verse 40, Christ said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They had been fired up all day. Jesus spoke in parables, as we saw. And sometimes when someone gives you a riddle, good gurus usually don't tell you things straight up. They usually tell you in a way in which you have to think and learn. Good teachers do the same thing. It evokes critical thinking and remembrance so that you can take it with you and impart it in your own life. But... The scriptures say that Jesus had spoken these parables to the crowd all day long, and then to the disciples in the boat, he would kind of explain in a little further context, a little further detail. So these guys, they had an incredible opportunity to be emboldened, to be fired up, and yet they still were afraid, and they still lacked faith. In verse 41, it says they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. That's honesty, right? I don't know. I don't have a, a scholarly degree in divinity. Uh, I don't know how long in terms of months or a year or 18 months or whatever uh, Jesus had spent with the 12 at this point in his ministry. But they had spent time with him. They had been appointed as his, his followers, as his students. And they had seen him perform miracles, healing people, casting demons out of people. And yet at this point in the story, they say, who is this? <laughs> who is this guy who controls the weather? A minute ago, or at the beginning of the evening, we didn't even know if he could tell the weather. And now he controls the weather. You know why I think they were so terrified, why they went from afraid to terrified? Because they knew that he was God in the flesh, and they were walking amongst something that they had read about and heard about and been told about their entire lives. Let's look at Psalm 89, verses 7 through 9. Again, right, I say that for us living in the 21st century, it's hard to read Scripture at times, especially in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It can be so confusing, right? But for these individuals who lived back then, when they saw something that was prophesied or quoted in Scripture or heard something that was prophesied and quoted in Scripture, 
they would have known immediately its implications and its deeper meaning. Psalm 89, verse 7, In the counsel of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging seas. When its waves mount up, you still them. I believe that it was at this point in the gospel account according to Mark that the twelve knew who Jesus really was. At this point, they had seen all these things. They had seen miracles performed. And even Peter had seen his mother-in-law healed of, of some kind of a sickness. But this is the first time that they had had, it, it's been accounted in the gospel that they had had a miracle performed for them. Right? And when something happens in our lives, it can become a shifting point, a quantum shift, where we change and are new in our perception, our cha- our process of changing mind repentance, right? That's something we teach very heavily here. And my prayer is that you do not leave here today feeling condemned, right? I mentioned spiritual disciplines. I mentioned equanimity, calmness in the state of a difficult situation. And all these things are necessary. Meditation, prayer, fellowship, fasting at times. All these things are are tools to help us grow closer to God. I mean to highlight the fact that you are not alone in relying on your own fruition when you go through storms. This account here is meant to share with us that the disciples did the same thing, the original disciples. So don't leave here feeling condemned, right? These guys who were with Jesus all the time had a full-blown mental breakdown. Leave here feeling inspired. Leave here feeling like you have the Spirit of God within you, that you can wake up Jesus within you at any point in time when you need him, that you are a friend of God, that you can speak to him face to face. And if you don't feel like you have that relationship, then I encourage you to pursue it with all of your mind, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. I encourage you to reach out to those who you trust, who you have community with, and ask them if you think that they have that relationship, how you can get to the same place in your life. True equanimity, calm in the face of a difficult situation that matters in this life, comes from the spirit that was taught by Christ. The disciples had to wake up Christ in the flesh, but those of us, who have been baptized into the faith are blessed with the ability to wake up Christ within us through the Spirit in the face of storms. I'm going to close with a quote from another uh, great church father, someone who was much less removed in the space of time from these mighty acts that we read about in the Gospel accounts. This is uh, Irenaeus of Leon, who lived at about 130 years A.D., 100 years after Jesus approximately had died. And he says, The initial step for us all to come to knowledge of God is the contemplation of nature. So as you go out and enjoy the spring day, let us contemplate on the nature of of Christ within us and within all the beautiful trees and bushes and streams and brooks and meadows that we encounter today. Let's go to him in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to be before you, to be connected to you in such an intimate way. 
the fact that you desire a relationship with us is just so incredible. You have taken us through all these storms in our lives, whether they be hardships that are seemingly insurmountable or just small squalls. We pray that we can wake you up within us as we face them and not rely on our own means, on our own strength. God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice and the humility that you put before us, for coming in the flesh and sharing with us wisdom that surpasses understanding. God, it is my prayer that we can stay abiding in your word, in your laws, in your precepts, and know you even deeper every day that you give our lungs breath. It is in Christ Jesus that we give thanks, especially for how you love us. Amen.